Well, thank you all very much. And, you know, I, I, in some ways, I like having a smaller group because it's more intimate and you can ask questions and you can feel very comfortable about asking questions, etc. So I like this. So, again, Michael McMillan, I've been working at the CFA Institute. I start, I'm starting on my ninth year. Um, I, I, ninth year working as an employee of CFA Institute. However, I've been involved with the Institute for 20 years. I started grading the CFA exam back in 1996 as a mere child, of course. And um, how I actually got into ethics was um, back in 1999. Um, the Institute, which was AIMR at that time, came to myself and a couple of other people and they said, um, we are interested in perhaps trying out item sets uh, because the growth in the exam was such that it was becoming difficult to grade all of those level three um, examinations. So the first topic that they wanted converted into an item set was ethics, because ethics essay questions were always the hardest and the most difficult to grade, because people would just, you know, do a, as we say, a brain dump on the page, and you'd have to fish through all of this writing to actually find out the right answer. So I actually began writing ethics questions many years ago. Now, here is, as Christian mentioned, here is how this ethics ses session or workshop differs from what you might see on the CFA exam. Because every single quest ethics question, as well as every other question on the CFA exam, has one right answer and two wrong answers. But in real life, most ethical dilemmas do not have clear, right, or wrong answers. So today, in addition to just a, a quick presentation, I'm going to present you with three different ethics questions. They're real life ethics situations, and I'm gonna ask you to vote um, using your cell phone, using your devices. If you have your device, I'm gonna give you a website to go to, and I'm gonna ask you to vote using your devices what would you do in this particular situation? So you're going to vote um, anonymously. I will reveal the results of the vote, and we can talk about the ethical issues involved. Is everybody comfortable with that? And by all means, this is, should be informal, so if you have any questions or anything else like that, by all means, ask. Um, as I... I I am a former professor of accounting and finance at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and this reminds me of one of my MBA classes where everyone sits in the back and <laughs> no one sits in the front row. So it's nice to see that even if, that the same tradition holds anywhere we go. Okay, so. Uh, just briefly, here are a couple of facts about the CFA Institute, a couple of updates. Right now, as of September 2016, we have there are 140,000 CFA charter holders around the world. We have 147 members of CFA Institute, but 140,000 charter holders. We now have 148 CFA societies and CFA Switzerland, I am told by uh, Christian, is the ninth largest, is the ninth largest. Um, of all the societies. One of the reasons why I wanted to show you this is to bring your attention to this fact. Right now, 62% of all of our members are based in the Americas. Canada, North America, South America. 62% of all our members. However, 46% of all of our candidates are coming from the Asia Pacific region. So huge growth in Asia, and 21% of our members and our registrations are coming from Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. 
Another point I want to mention is this. Over the past 25 years or more, the number of women who are charholders has stayed constant at 18%. So one of the newest initiatives of the CFA Institute is to encourage more women to not only become involved in the investment profession, but also to pursue their CFA charter. So there are a number of initiatives that all of the societies are making to uh, hopefully increase that number. I also bring that up because this year, 43% of the candidates who are registering for the exam in Asia are women. So we think that although there is that, that, that imba we believe that so much of the, that imbalance which we find in the Americas will eventually change once the globalization uh, continues of the CFA designation. Okay? Any questions, comments? Yes, sir? Why do you focus on women? Do you believe they are more ethical? <laughs> or, or, or what's the no, 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 no. The issue is not just women in particular. The issue is just diversity overall. And we believe that a more diverse, a more representative industry, an industry that really represents the, the makeup of our client base, whether it's institutional or, or individual client, will make for a better industry. You know, when you have a greater, greater variance of thoughts or perspectives, I think that makes the investment process and the investment decision making better. So that's why. Um, I don't, I, I'm not saying that women are more ethical than men, um, although that would actually be a good, good research project to study, you know? <laughs> So here, before we begin, I'm going to ask you to do this. <coughs> if you have a smartphone um, or a device, I'm going to ask you to go to this. Oh wait, let me just turn this off. To go to this website and then use this login, and that's C F A I. Um, it can be capital letters. It can be small letters. This is not case sensitive. I'll put it back on the screen in one second. Let me just do this. While you're at it, you might as well put it on mute if it starts ringing. Oh, you your phones? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, here we go. All right, and you'll see, once you get log into the website, you'll see polling closed. Okay, good. Okay, is everybody with me on this? Okay, good. Well, yeah, uh, if you have any difficulty, I'll go around in one second. All right, so let's talk about ethics. This is basically how we define ethical behavior. It's really doing the right thing when no one else is watching, even when doing the wrong thing is legal. And I believe that one of the reasons why there's been such trust loss in the investment industry and such anger directed towards the investment industry is because so many of the um, activities that precipitated the financial crisis were in fact legal but they weren't ethical. So as CFA charter holders, you know that we cannot just follow and do what's legal. We are required to live up to a much higher standard. And I think this is one of the reasons why there continues to um, be such strong demand 
for CFA charter holders by employers and why enrollment in the CFA program continues. As a quick point, last year, or for 2016, we had over 205,000 candidates sit for the CFA exam all around the world. So, this is how we define ethics at CFA Institute. It begins with education. As investment professionals, we need to know the laws, the rules, and the regulations of the jurisdictions in which we're doing business in. So ethics certainly begins with education. But then it requires thinking. Thinking about honesty, integrity, character, and stewardship. And I'm going to come back to stewardship in one moment, but two things I want to bring to your attention. Um, one is, over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk to people and do research into why people do the things that they do. And one is, I think there's a difference between unethical people and unethical actions or unethical behavior. And most of the people who get into trouble are not unethical people, it's their actions that are unethical. The second thing is, I think one of the reasons why people end up in these situations is because they often don't stop and think about the consequences or the perceptions of what they're doing before they do them. So over the years, it's been my pleasure to travel uh, with and around four CFA Institute. As a matter of fact, this is the third week of my round the world tour. I spent uh, my first week in Lagos, Nigeria, last week in um, um, East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, my week here. I bring this up only to say that oftentimes when I'm traveling, people ask me what I do for a living. And I tell them I teach ethics to investment professionals. And I've learned to pause for about two minutes until the laughter dies down. <laughs> These people are like, oh no, seriously, what do you do? <laughs> and I say, that's what I do. I teach ethics to investment professionals. And then oftentimes the next question is, well, can you really teach people to be ethical? And I say, absolutely not. But what I can encourage to people to do is to think about what they're doing before they do them. And if I can get people to do that, I think we're going a long way to hopefully raising the ethical behavior of all participants in our industry. So stewardship. It's the careful and responsible management of money that is entrusted to our care. Think about it. Whenever we go to a doctor, we go to a doctor and the doctor um, examines us and then he provides prescriptions or recommends other things that we should do. As we're sitting there, there is no, listening to this doctor, there is no doubt in our mind that everything the doctor is telling us to do is solely in our best interest. This is, the, this is the same feeling that clients should have when they come and talk to investment professionals. They should feel comfortable that the recommendations that we're, we're providing to them, the analysis that we're providing to them, is solely in their best interest. As doctors or stewards of our health, as investment professionals, we are stewards of our clients' money. So. If everybody has their phone uh, 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 juiced up and ready, this is our first case, and you should see this on your phone. Do you? Good. Whew. Technology. Often is not kind. Is often not kind. This is a true story, um, and I'll tell you what happened in the end. So, your boss who hired you and has mentored you for the past three years is being unfairly let go because of office politics. As the sole support of her family, she is concerned about finding another job. 
A week before she's scheduled to leave, she places a stack of files on your desk and asks you to copy them. The files contain research reports that she wrote, marketing presentations containing her performance record, and spreadsheet models that she created. So what would you do in this particular circumstance? Would you A, <coughs> copy the files, B, refuse to copy the files, C, only copy the research reports that she wrote, or D, only copy the spreadsheets she created? So I'll give you a moment to think about this, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so let's see how, how people have voted. Oh, I see some votes there. That's good. So let me ask you, um, before I reveal the results, you don't have to tell me what you said, but I just want you to, I want to ask you, is there an ethical issue in this particular circumstance? Yes? Okay, and, and what do you think the ethical issue is? Even a legal issue that research and all intellectual work done at work is the property of the firm. Right. So uh, that's, I would say, the first and the point that comes to mind. Okay, so yes, um, everything that you do when you work at a firm is the property of the firm. Is that right? And so, what is she actually asking you to do in this particular circumstance? Because she's planning on taking this information with her when she leaves. I think this is when you respond. What do you think? What do you think she's asking you to do? She's basically asking you to help her steal company information. Is that right? All right. So let's see what people say. But, but before yes. you say, if you're not aware that she's leaving, that you're a huge firm, you know, hundreds of people, and then, you know, it's a colleague, and she has decided to resign, and you're not aware of any problem, and then it can do the job because you're the secretary of. Yeah, you are just asked to do it, yes. And then, okay, no problem, I can take I do it. Because sure. you're not aware she, she has resigned, you know, right. it's your, part of your job to make copies or prints or something. Yeah, no, no, so, that's perfectly true. But this is a very specific situation where this is your boss, this is someone who's <clears> hired you and has mentored you for three years that you know uh, that is being that you believe is being unfairly let go. This is the specific situation that this individual found themselves in, and they knew that they were going to copy these materials because this individual wanted to take them with her. Okay, that's this is the situation. So, thirty-three percent of you said you would copy the files, which is very interesting. Uh, 30, 56% of you said you would refuse to copy the files. And let me just ask, who would refuse to copy the files? Okay. All right. And so why would you refuse to copy the files, Mike? The simple and easy answer you can give to her is that it's questioning your integrity. Okay. And if in a future thing that she came to you for something, she would then have question marks because you've done something unethical before her. Okay, but let me just remind you of a couple of facts here. And I, I thank you for your answer. The, first of all, this is your boss, and she's still your boss for the next week or so. In addition, this is the person who hired you and who has mentored you for the past three years. So it may be quite difficult for us at this, and who you believe is being unfairly let go. But still for someone who I respect. Yes. subsequently follow into a new role, potentially. Right. 
you're actually showing more of your own character mm -hmm. in turning around and giving them, look, you need to go through the right channels to get this information. Right. Because otherwise you're still not going to be allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. So you're actually helping them in the long term, although they will obviously be frustrated in the short term. Right. And if you did do something unethical, like okay, they, they've got it, they've exploited you and used it, because obviously they're still feeling aggrieved. Right. And it doesn't actually help either of you in the long term. Okay, all right. No, I think that's, that's a very, very good point. Very, very good point. But I will tell you this, and this leads to later in my discussion, is this individual copied the files. They copied the files, but they felt uncomfortable doing it, but they felt, but they copied the files. Uh, this individual was still their boss, as well as they felt like they owed some loyalty to this individual because of all the help that this person had done to get them into the firm as well as to mentor them. Um, a, a week later, after the boss left, this individual still felt uncomfortable about what they had done, and they went to see the boss's boss. And they told the boss's boss, this is what I've done, I felt uncomfortable with it, but I did it, and I didn't know what else to do. So the boss's boss was not happy that they had made these copies. At the same time, they were thankful that this individual had told them, this is what I've done, because if they would have found out in any other way, this individual perhaps could have gotten into trouble as well. So, one of the reasons why I bring this case up, and we'll come back to that, is this. Most people, when we talk about ethics, um, and before I go, let me start off with, you know, there's a whole new area of finance called behavioral finance. And behavioral finance has really challenged the assumptions underlying traditional financial models. And the key assumption underlying traditional financial models is that we are rational individuals. And when prevented, presented with investment decisions, we will always choose the choice that will maximize our return given our, a certain level of risk. Well, behavioral finance and the research provided by behavioral finance has challenged that primary assumption and has shown through a variety of different ways that we are not rational human beings when it comes to making investment decisions. The same thing has happened in the area of ethics. There is now a new area of ethics called behavioral ethics, which has challenged the, the traditional um, assumption underlying ethical decision making. This model assumes that, again, people are rational, we're decisive, and we act in, court, in accordance with our intentions and understand the implications. Basically, the traditional model says when presented with an ethical dilemma, we, uh, we are very deliberate and conscious in how we approach that dilemma and how we arrive at a decision to address that dilemma. This is actually not the case. Emotions. Emotions play a large part, not only in how we make investment decisions, but also how we make ethical decisions also. Emotions such as guilt, shame, anger, play a significant role in our ethical decision making and often lead people to make instinctive ethical judgments that they cannot logically defend. So in that last example, um, emotions such as uh, loyalty, emotions such as perhaps anger, because here's this person who has helped you, is being unfairly let go, these are things that may cause you to not even think about the ethical implications of that act and copy those files. So emotional responses can sometimes lead us to make inaccurate judgments and take inappropriate actions. As a result, it is not a select few who can succumb to unethical behavior. All of us are susceptible to making unethical decisions because we are all affected by emotions. So 
Um, the famous um, behavioralist, Daniel Kahneman, has found that we have two systems in our brain that govern how we make decisions. There's system one, there's system two. Most of the ethical decisions, or most of the decisions we make, are governed by that system one portion of our brain. Which, which causes us to make decisions quickly, effortly, and intuitively. It's that second system that's slow, reasoning, more control, but it's our system one that really leads us to make the decisions that we do first. Uh, most human decision making is made emotionally and intuitively with the system one part of our brain before the cognitive parts of the brain, system two, engage. As a result, decisions are not as reasoned as they may seem. Okay? This quote, I think, kind of um, uh, capsul capsulizes what we're saying. Situational influences have more to do with unethical behavior than a person's character. Under the right conditions, good people, and I mean all of us in this room, can be induced, seduced, and initiated to act unethically. Um, factors leading to unethical behavior, well, one of them is obedience to authority. Your boss asks you to do something. We have the desire to please authority, which sometimes, if our boss asks us to do something, we do it without really seeing the ethical implications of what they're asking us to do. Uh, conformity bias. We have a tendency to follow the crowd. And when we see other people doing things, we have a tendency to do them also with, again, not realizing perhaps the ethical dimensions of what the crowd is doing. Incrementalism, that, that, that gradual slide down the slippery slope. You know, Bernie Madoff, who I'm sure we are all of, or know about, did not wake up one day and say, I'm going to steal $500 million from my clients today. It happened over a space of time. Actually, it really happened, it began with, he was using this option strategy. And one quarter, the, the, his performance did not meet the performance that he had promised his clients. So what did he do? He called his accountant up and he said, listen, we need to just fudge the quarterly results for this quarter to cover up the fact that I didn't hit the target or the benchmark, and, but I know next quarter we'll hit the benchmark and we'll, that's all you'll need to do. Well, next quarter he didn't hit the benchmark. And so this, this, this covering up of performance continued on and on until it just completely got out of control. Incrementalism. And this last one again, we are all subject to. We're overconfident about our own ethics. I'm more ethical than they are, it won't happen to me. And if you feel that way, oftentimes that means that you don't stop and think about the consequences or perceptions of what you're doing before you <clears throat> So, here's a true life story that happened to one of our CFA society members. So I'm going to ask you again, what would you do in this particular situation? Paul Hahn is a portfolio manager at AMG Insurance Company, and he's also president of the local CFA society. In an effort to offer more benefits to its members, the society has contacted a number of insurance companies to see if they will offer discounts on home and car insurance. The society received bids from five insurance companies, including ANG. All members, all board members, including Han, who worked for these companies, recused themselves from the decision-making process. After careful analysis, the board chose ANG because they provided the best offer. To thank Han for suggesting ANG, 
his boss gives him a $1,000 bonus check. So what should he do? Should he A, accept the check and disclose it to the board? B, refuse the check? C, donate the check to charity? Or D, donate the check to the CFA Society, his local CFA Society? So I ask you vote. What would you do in this particular circumstance? And if you have a phone other than a BlackBerry, if you'd like to vote, I'll get it set up. It's okay. 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 All right. So go ahead, vote. What would you do in this circumstance? Am I to unlock it? And I've always found that truth is stranger than fiction. So I always welcome uh, CFA charter holders or members or whomever to tell me about ethical dilemmas that they confronted. Um, because they always make great cases. And I was at the SLC in Hong Kong, um, Society Leadership Conference in Hong Kong, last October in 2015. And this individual, of course, his name has been changed, uh, came up and told me about the situation. I thought, ooh, that, that makes a good, uh, that'll make a good case. All right, so I think people have voted. And let me ask you, what, are there any ethical issues in this particular case? recommend the, his company exactly. and, and sometimes if you recommend an employee for a job or something like that the firm often gives you a bonus because you've recommended this person is that correct yeah, yeah. so so what you turned down money because you didn't do anything for it I think that's called a job what do you mean? The wrong impression because uh, even though he did not do anything, he was not, I mean, maybe people will see, see that it's indirectly in the process. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Oh, and you think that the reason why, oh, it was improper because the boss gave him a thousand dollar check thinking that he was the one who was responsible for the company being ch chosen. But just to chosen. say thank you for suggesting us. Exactly, being chosen or putting on the, on the list. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Yes, sir. Maybe in this specific case, it's not so much a concern about what happened right now, but what could happen in the future when you, in two or three years' time, you say, okay, let's look if better offers are available. Right. And you renew the whole process, <laughs> and he knows, okay, if I. If I uh, enable that this company gets the business, I will get again a check that he I'm sure has an uh, Okay, all right, I see that. It, but, you know, it could be in two or three years when the contract is um, renewed, um, he may not be president again. May not be president again. And he would still have to recuse himself from the decision. But let's see what you said. And by the way, I can defend every single one of these uh, choices. Oh, well, at least I like this donate to charity. Thank you. Somebody's it's in the holiday season. You know, good. All right, so 80% of you say refuse the check. Why on earth should he refuse the check? He didn't, it's, he didn't do anything. Well, 
that's probably why. No, but <laughs> it's not like it also, uh, But I mean, it's not like he was involved in the actual decision making. He recused himself. It just doesn't feel right to get the money. For okay. Because if you work for a company, automatically, it's part of your job. Wherever you are representing or attending an event, to oh, did you have a salary already for that? Exactly to say to suggest your company. Okay, loyal to the company. All right, and I, I I hear your point. I'm just going to say one thing. Notice he's a portfolio manager for the company, and this is the division that does car and homeowner insurance. So you know, completely different. Still, yeah. yes. Who else had a comment? Yes. You're just avoiding any suggestions of impropriety or conflicts of interest. Okay. Because it only takes someone to create the false judgment, and then it either reflects poorly on your company or on the way that the society has run the process. You sit there and go, oh, well, we recused ourselves. Right. But it's a much better story that you are seeing and the perception is such that it's much easier. Now, if it's sort of for a huge sum of money, great. But for a thousand bucks, it's probably not worth the percent of the potential downside. So at this point in time, it's very, very fine. Would be any suggestions of proprietary, not having to declare things. And then when people come, if they do, go and audit it, you can sit there and go, well, actually, I've been out of the process and I'm not involved, I'm not conflicted. Okay. Who agrees with Mike? Um, okay. All right, great. Uh, well, we have. I, I gave this case at one of our regional um, society meetings last year in, um, in San Diego because the society that was involved was one of the America societies. And Paul Hahn was actually sitting in the back of the room when I showed this case and we had the, the, the debate about the issues. And um, so at the end of the debate, I said, well, will Mr. Hahn please stand up and tell us what he did? And so he stood up and he basically said pretty much what you said, uh, Mike. He refused the check because it just looked bad. Although it was on record that he had recused himself, it was in the minutes, it just really wasn't worth the potential misperception that there was some sleight of hand involved or some conflict of interest involved. And I do have to say nowadays perceptions can be as damning, if not more damning, than reality. So he just felt, let's just keep it clean, yes, thank you for the check, etc. but I, I'm just going to refuse it because it will just make everyone's life, especially mine, that much easier. He did consider donating the check to charity, but the fact is he believed, because I accepted the check, regardless of what I eventually did with it, may still be an issue to some. Um, he also considered donating the check to the CFA Society, but then the, the society, then he thought, well, the society might feel obligated when the contract up again, came up again, well, perhaps we need to give this A&G a little bit of extra attention since they were the ones who gave us the check from the very beginning, all right? So again, you know, sometimes you know, other people would say, well, yeah, I'll take the check. I haven't done anything wrong. I wasn't involved in the decision making, all of those other factors. But it's always important to think about perception. So, one last one, which is a little bit more complicated, but also a real life story, a true life story. So, you recently started a new job as a senior portfolio manager at an investment management fund. Previously, you were an analyst for a private equity firm where your last assignment was to analyze Gates, a private biotechnology company. While conducting due diligence on Gates, you learned that the company was completing clinical trials for a vaccine that will prevent a number of diseases. 
the analyst on your team at the mutual fund, at the investment fund, tell you that they plan to invest in Biomed, a publicly traded competitor of Gates. You believe that the vaccine Gates is developing will have a detrimental impact on Biomed. So what should you do? And I'm actually going to change this question. Instead of asking you what should you do, I'm going to ask you what would you do? Because there's often a big gap between should and would. So what would you do in this situation? Would you say nothing because you, in fact, did sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, at the private equity firm when you left? Would you be place Biomed on the firm's restricted list to prevent the analyst from buying Biomed? Would you see, discourage the team from investing in Biomed without telling them what you know? Or would you just tell the analyst everything that you know about Gates? And as you're thinking about this, pondering what to do, think about this. In this particular circumstance, to whom do you owe a duty to? Do you owe a duty to your prior employer, the private equity firm? Do you owe a duty to your current employer? Or, and, do you owe a duty to the clients who are in the fund that you're currently managing? Yes, sir. So is the information publicly available about this? Vaccine? No, it is not. No. It is not. And because the assumption, it, Yes. Sorry. The assumption is that you signed this non-disclosure agreement in all four cases. That is correct. Possible. That is correct. Because, yes, when you left the private equity firm, you signed a non-disclosure agreement. And Gates is a private biotechnology company. So all of this information about their clinical trials, et cetera, are not, uh, it's not public. <clears throat> this is a hard decision. This is a very, very uh, difficult case. As people are voting, let me ask you, is there an ethical issue in this particular circumstance? Yes? It, it's, it, it, it is material, non-public information. You are in possession of material, non-public information. I would say yes. But the question is, what is the best alternative and to whom do you owe a duty to in this circumstance? Right? I'm curious to see what people said. This one. Okay, well, that's interesting. I, you know, I'm, believe me, I can defend every single one of these answers. So who said A, say nothing because you signed a non-disclosure agreement? Oh, wow. That seems like more than 13%, but okay. So, okay, Marco, I'll, I'll say, I'll ask you this. The analysts on your team really like Biomed, and they like it so much that they are willing to place 5% of the portfolio in Biomed. You're going to just go, mm hmm go right ahead. No, that's not what it says here. You're just going to say nothing. You're just going to say nothing. Is that right? Oh, no, Mike. You're going to say nothing? 
Yes? There is one element, though, right? He, okay, well, it's his current thinking that gates will be huge, huge as that was well. Maybe that they won't. I know, but at this point, he Who knows? believes. No, 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 no. no. But at this point, he believes that this is the case. So the question is, what do you do at this potential moment? So when the analysts come to you, for those of you who said say nothing, they say, oh, we love it so much. We're going to put 5% of the portfolio. What are you going to say? You're going to say nothing. You're going to allow them to do it. What about the risk management? Okay, 3% of the portfolio. <laughs> I know, but I mean, the point is, hold on, hold on. But 3%, okay? I think you will have a very hard time to, to argue if, if Gates will have a, or Bayman will have a huge jump in, in, uh, uh, in stock and you have to, to explain that you didn't have any information or you didn't discuss it with your analyst and in your own portfolio, I think you will be rather challenged in, in this argument. Okay, so you would have to say something, right? Do you feel like you would have to say something? Because many people, many people believe that they have no other choice but to remain silent and to allow the analysts to do it since they did sign a non-disclosure agreement. Isn't that right? So you have no other choice but to let them go down that road. It may come out three weeks later, the Gates may come out with the vaccine. The stock plunges. There goes the performance of the portfolio. There goes your bonus. But you're still going to say nothing. Okay. Good. You just want to know. All right. So 50% of you will, well, let me go to the D. Tell the analysts everything you know about Gates. Now, um, aren't you um, disclosing material non-public information in addition to violating the non-disclosure agreement? Aren't you using that information to change the buying decision of analysts? Isn't that not what you're supposed to do if you have material non-public information? So that's why I'm not going to ask who chose D. <laughs> But I am going to ask you this, though. Even if you told the analysts everything you know about Gates, would you ever get in trouble? Because most regulators, they are looking for people who use material non-public information to act upon it. In this particular case, you're using material non-public information to prevent people from acting on it. So who would ever know? No, that's not correct. <laughs> okay. If you are stopping investing in biomedicine. Yes. Which, uh, without that information, you're allowed to Right. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, would you get caught? Not whether it's right or wrong. Okay. I'm just saying, would you get caught? Yes, sir. Well, it could well be that by telling the, the truth or by developing what, what, what uh, he knows about uh, Gates, Gates, yes. Yeah, that this changes the mind uh, of the perception of the investment and that the, the, oh, it the, would the, change the, guy, mind. Mm -hmm. the guys would, instead of investing in uh, Biomed, would in, uh, invest in Gates instead. And then it would become an insider, uh, um, in, in a way it, it would become illegal, yeah. Well, it would be illegal. First of all, Gates is a private company, so they couldn't invest in Gates. But if you told them everything you know about Biomed, they definitely would not invest in Biomed. Mm -hmm. So you are using this material non-public information to change the buying decision of Atlas. And I thought that's what you weren't supposed to do. Maybe. But can you do it? Is it all right to do because you're going to save clients money? Because you owe a duty to your clients. Is that a good reason? Maybe. Yes? 
Yes. So it's okay to break the law if it's for the benefit of your clients. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on part of the clients. Okay. All right, so um, now if you place Biomed on the firm's restricted list, aren't you still using your material non-public information to change the buying decision of the analyst? Isn't that the same thing? Sort of as D, but you're just not telling them, but you're preventing them anyway. Is that right? Is it also that once something goes on restricted list, that means that there is a conflict? Or there is some issue involved. Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. All right, so let me ask you this, and we'll, I'll tell you what happened. Is there an answer E out there? I gave you A, B, C, and D. Is there an answer E? Yes. Okay, recuse yourself from the decision. Yes, Mike, you were going to say something. Yeah. No, no, if, if, if the fiduciary duty you got to your client yes. is such that you need to protect them from the detrimental effects of violence. Even if it means breaking the law. Well, when is <laughs> you are you're still in position of material non public interest. That is correct. And that bit you can't contest. What you can look at is there's no guarantee so that the correlation between what Gates may or may not do and the impact that will or won't have Bio. Right. So, toward, so towards C, which is to where I was angling, is yeah. that if you look at it from the SWOT analysis, yes. okay, right, you're advocating this on the basis of strengths and opportunities, and then you bring about, well, I feel for weaknesses and threats in terms of or whatever your internal metrics and process are, okay. or dissuading them away from it, in which case you've not necessarily exposed yourself or uh, brought them in within the material of public information. Okay. But you're still trying to protect your ongoing best interest and fiduciary duty you have towards your clients. Okay. All right. But suppose if these analysts, these analysts are CFA charter holders, they've done their SWOT analysis with all the public information that's out there. They've used reasonable care, prudent judgment, they've investigated everything, and they feel comfortable. On the basis of what they've got, they have the mosaic theory. If they feel as though they've pieced together enough, that, yes, uh, Biomed is a better bet than the competition. Yes, then uh, you can sit there and have the reasoned discussion. You so through C, you're exploring, and you can discourage them if they persuade you. They've done all their research, and this is why. Right. Then you turn around and go, okay, well we buy it. So you buy it. So you say nothing, and you just let them buy it. So, you can throw his clients. <laughs> what you don't know is how compelling the drivers are they've got in terms of the return, okay. and how much of the return stream in Biomed is potentially conflicted. Okay. If they're turning around and going, we've got a 9x return here, of which only 10% is potentially uh, sort of going to be impacted. Right. Uh, and yet, the detrimental impact, you don't know how large that is. Okay. So if they're turning around going, hey, this is this is biotech, it's a, it's a multiple return, mm -hmm. then the fact that maybe an incremental degradation to that, um, you can still believe in the work and the analysis that has been put together by the okay. team. All right, that's fine. That's fine. All right, so let me tell you what happens in the, in the real life situation. This individual realized that they were in a no-win situation. And so they did, very similar to what Marco originally suggested, they went to the compliance department. And when you have a problem like this, you take your problem and you make it theirs. <laughs> right? And so after, without telling them everything that they knew about Biomed, they did say, listen, the analyst, I'm in a bad position because I'm in possession of material non-public information that could have a negative effect on an investment that the analyst want to make. 
So it was the compliance department, after consult consultation with the legal department, that decided to place Biomed on the firm's restricted list. But it was the compliance department, not the individual, that decided to do that. So in many ways, this individual was protected by the compliance department. But it's a real life situation, and they can be very, very difficult to address. So I love this cartoon. Run this by the legal department, but run super fast so the ethics department doesn't see it. You know, as you know, there's often a big difference between the law and ethics. The law tells us what we can and cannot do. Ethics really is a much higher standard, what we should and shouldn't do. And again, I think one of the reasons why employers like to hire charter holders is because they know we cannot do what is legal. We have to do what is ethical. We always must live up to that higher standard. So, a couple of last comments about rationalizations. We often rationalize our actions to reduce the negative effect that a company is doing something unethical. We rationalize it. We use it to justify behavior that is inconsistent with our own opinions of ourselves. We also use rationalizations to change the perception of the situation. So we can use that change perception to defend our behavior. Two things. One, there's never been an act done since the beginning, from a kid stealing candy to a dictator committing genocide that the person doing it didn't think he was fully justified. That's a mental trick called rationalizing, and it's done the human race more harm than anything else you can name. Here are a couple of rationalizations. Everybody else is doing it, so it must be okay. Uh, that's the way they're doing it at that firm. Um, if we don't do it, someone else will. It doesn't really hurt anyone. It's not a big deal. And then this last, he or she deserved it. And then this last one, with which newer entrants into our industry are very susceptible to. I want to be a team player. I want to be loyal. You know, copy these files, be loyal, be a team player, right? So, creating a culture of integrity, it's important that we encourage our employees to become more conscious of their own thoughts and behaviors so that hopefully they'll notice and act upon an ethical issue before it becomes a problem. We need to make our employees aware that ethical dilemmas are a normal and predictable part of most jobs, that they're always going to, they're eventually going to experience some type of a dilemma. Discuss approaches for dealing with ethical issues. Um, help employees recognize that ethical behavior is part of the organization's traditions and values. Um, incorporate ethical decision-making in all aspects. Any time a decision is made, it's important to look at the ethical aspects of it. And what's also important is ethics is not just from the top down. Because as we, you can have the most ethical CEO in the world, but as an employee, I don't come in contact with that CEO on a daily basis. I come in contact with my immediate supervisor or manager. And if it's that individual who is encouraging unethical behavior, et cetera, that's where the problem lies. So I'll leave you with two comments. It's important for all of us to keep ethics in our frame of reference so that we don't fall prey to the psychological tendencies which can affect ethical awareness. Every day, those of us who desire to act ethically must remind ourselves of our ethical aspirations and the need to constantly keep our ethical radar or antenna um, extended. Last quote, um, a code of ethics cannot make people or companies ethical, but nor can hammers and saws produce furniture. In both cases, they are necessary tools which need intelligent design and use. So, on that note, I will end. Do we have time for questions, Christian?
Ah. Uh. No. <laughs>